Today I'm going to be talking about Marx's reproduction schemes. These were introduced in volume two of Capital, which unfortunately is probably the least read volume of Capital. They are a very innovative set of ideas for their time and provide the basis of what later became called input-output tables or input-output analysis. But you can analyze and demonstrate a lot of macroeconomic relationships using these reproduction schemes. Now it's possible to do it much better these days than was possible in the 19th century because we have spreadsheets and you can show the relationships interactively. You can get the calculations done for you using the spreadsheets. So I'm showing how you can do this using spreadsheets in this tutorial. This is a an example of a Marxist reproduction scheme that I've set up using Google Sheets. You can do it with any spreadsheet, but Google Sheets is better because it has a feature known as iterative solution, which allows you to solve a sheet which contains a series of interlinked equations and comes up with a solution. Other spreadsheets don't allow this inter interlinked equation solving and you have to do more of the work yourself. Now let's explain what the reproduction scheme is about. It divides the economy into three sectors. In, in some of the earlier reproduction schemes there are only two but I'm giving the final version of it. Sector one produces means of production. A sector is shown as a row. Sector 2a is a section of the economy which produces necessities and all goods which reproduce labour power. Sector 2b in Marx's account is a sector which produces luxuries for the capitalist class but you can extend that to include things like the armaments industry, things which do not reproduce the working class but are met out of surplus value. Now the point about the reproduction scheme is that he uses it to show a series of quite complicated functional dependencies which have to exist between different sectors of the economy. And if one is not used to thinking of things in terms of functional dependencies, in terms of systems governed by interlinked equations, some of the relationships which they bring out are counterintuitive. But let's go through it step by step, explaining what the parts of the, the diagram I've given is, because I have put in some additional information which Marx includes in the text of his explanation. I've put it into the table here. The C, V and S are headings which show the quantities of constant capital, variable capital and surplus value in each sector. The living labour shows the, as it implies, the amount of actual living labour time used in that sector. And the total output value is formed by the sum of C, V and S. But I've put it in as a, a total there for clarity. Now down at the bottom, again for clarity, I have put out the total amount of each type of good or category of good that is used. So if we look at the constant capital column here, we see that sector one used a hundred pounds of constant capital, sector two 50 pounds, sector two B 50 pounds. So the total amount of constant capital used up was 200. Now this actually has to match up with the total amount of means of production produced that year. The two have to equi equate if the economy is in simple reproduction. That is to say the economy is per persisting at the same scale and not accumulating or shrinking. It's the simplest form of analysis. So we assume in this analysis that we've got simple reproduction. 
So the amount of means of production produced has to equal the amount of means of production consumed. Similarly, if you go down the V column, this shows the amount paid in wages in each sector. I've said £100 there. Let's assume it's £100 billion to make it more realistic. These are the amounts paid in wages in each sector. They add up to £250 shown here, or £250 billion. That is money that is spent by workers on necessities. So the output of the necessities industry has to be equal to this. The wages are equal to the output of the necessities industry. Now Marx is assuming that workers can't save. That workers' living standards are such that they have to spend their entire income on necessities. So this is the amount used to reproduce labour power and this is the total amount of money being spent on that and they add up. The total amount of profits here, the S column adds to 250 million or 250 billion what have you and that is equal to the total amount spent on luxuries, armaments etc. Now because there are functional dependencies here, the spreadsheet I've created, and there's a shared version online, is one which only the areas in light grey can be altered. If you edit the spreadsheet, you're only allowed to alter these. That's because all the other ones are determined by functional relationships that Marx explains. For example, if we look at this cell here, which is the amount of constant capital used in Department 2, Monk says that the amount of constant capital used in Department 2 has to equal the amount of variable capital used in Department 1. So what I've shown in the spreadsheet, there's a spreadsheet tutorial at this point, I have put the equation that the cell B3 is equal to the cell C2 because that's one of the functional relationships Marx explains. Now why does that functional relationship exist? Well, what happens is that the capitalists in Department 1 pay out £50 in wages, the workers in Department 1 then buy £50 of necessities from the capitalists in Department 2, and the capitalists in Department 2 can then spend those £50 of necessities in purchasing. I've explained the relationship between V in Department 1 and C in Department 2A. A similar relationship exists between S in Department 1 and C in 2B. The capitalists in Department 1 spend their profits on luxuries. That gives £50 to the capitalists in Department 2B, who can then spend those £50 buying £50 worth of means of production from Department 1. So the capitalist expenditure in Department 1 on luxuries returns to them in additional sales of means of production to Department 2B and they get their profit back. Any profit they spend on luxuries comes back to them. Now let's look at the V column. The V column is also governed by an equation and the equation is that it is the amount of total labour multiplied by the rate of exploitation or the, what I've got, sorry, the sh wage share. The wage share is a half since the rate of exploitation is 100%. So if 100 units of real labour are used, the workers only get half of those back. £50 there, £100 there, £100 there. So this column is functionally dependent on the wage rate and the amount of living labour. The S column is given by the difference 
between the total costs of the capitalists in this sector, which is their constant capital and their variable capital, and their total sales. And that gives their profits. So the profits are their total sales minus their costs. Now, what this means is that that entire column and that entire column are set up by equations. And the, con the totals here are obviously set up by equations because they're the totals of all of these. Now, what this means is you have a recursive set of relationships in the economy. You have a whole bunch of cells in this table, but they have what mathematicians say only four degrees of freedom. And the degrees of freedom are given by the cells which I've shown in light format. If you change any one of these cells, you will produce consequential change throughout the whole system. So suppose I increased the organic composition of capital in section one. This will echo through the whole system. So this has increased the output of department one and increased the total used by department one. But it's also total means of production used. But it doesn't have any effect beyond that because the it just means that department one has to reuse a greater share of its means of production. Now, I cannot actually alter the organic composition in any of the other departments except by means of altering the amounts of labor available. It, these are not free variables. The organic composition in every other department is actually controlled by the, dis the real distribution of labor power. If I were to say that I'm going to transfer, for example, 100 units of living labor from Department 2A to Department 1, then you'll get a consequential rise in the organic composition of capital in the other sectors. Okay, I've kept the amount, total amount of labor the same, and what's happened is that the organic composition of capital in all the other sectors has risen. They've now risen, instead of being equal to one another, they've, they've become higher. And this changes the overall rate of surplus value. The rate of surplus value has gone up. Why is that? It's because in the end, less of the total labor force is producing necessities. A lower portion of the total value of product of the labor, social labor, is going into the production of necessities for the working class, which implies a higher rate of exploitation. So this shows that there are non-obvious relations which exist. Marx distinguishes two kinds of surplus value absolute surplus value produced by lengthening the working day and relative surplus value produced by an improvement in productivity which enables fewer workers to be involved in producing the real wage. Now I will illustrate the effect of relative surplus value by just cutting the amount of workers producing the real wage. I'm going to assume that a hundred units of labor power are taken away and these hundred people just emigrate. What's happened here is that the rate of surplus value has doubled because half as much labor is now being used to produce the necessities. There are consequential changes throughout the, the rest of the system. The price of necessities sold goes down and consequently the price of luxuries and arms goes up because there's more surplus value. So this shows that the effect of reducing the amount of labor producing necessities is to raise this rate of surplus value and to increase the surplus value in department um, 2b.
increase the, the total surplus in department two, the to total output of department two B. So the total amount going in luxuries goes up. I've restored the system to its original state again. Now, in order to show the point that I made in my last video, that the luxury and armament sector cannot produce surplus value, we will see what the effect of improving productivity in the arms industry or luxuries industry would be. Do exactly the same experiment as we did with Department 2A and do it in Department 2B. We will reduce the amount of labour by 100 in this sector. What happens? Well, the wage rate actually rises and the rate of surplus value actually falls. So the effect of improvement in productivity in Department 2B is the opposite of an improvement in productivity in Department 2A. So no improvement in productivity in Department 2B can actually increase the quantity of surplus value. On the contrary, it reduces it. And you can see this quite clearly if you take your mind away from money. If you take your mind away from the symbolic representation of labour in money and focus on what has really happened in terms of the distribution of labour. What has happened is there is now fewer workers producing luxuries. Fewer workers producing luxuries means that there is a lower rate of exploitation. So it is the actual distribution of real labour, living labour, that determines everything else, apart from the one other free determinant, which is the amount of machinery required to produce machinery. Everything else in the system is determined by the distribution of labour power between the, the three different sectors. Now what this indicates is that sector 2B is entirely unproductive. You cannot produce more surplus value in sector 2B. The size of sector 2B is entirely determined by the degree of exploitation in sector 1 and 2A. It is a dependent sector and there can be no productivity or sorry no production of surplus value in the armaments industries, luxury industries or any industries that solely serve the interests of the property classes. What have we learned from this? The first thing is that reproduction schemes bring out functional dependencies between sectors of the economy, dependencies which are not always obvious. Second point is that there are a limited number of degrees of freedom in Marx's three sector scheme. The four degrees of freedom are the real distribution of living labour between three sectors and the machinery required to produce machinery. You can use the reproduction schemes to understand the production of relative surplus value and you can also use them to see that sector 2B must be unproductive. I have placed an online copy of the spreadsheet available for people to look at.